All right, peace and abundance, everybody. Welcome back, Market Review. Monday, March 14th. Shout out to my brother Aki for holding it down Thursday and Jay. Um, but, you know, um, this is Market Review, Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. I am your host, MJ the Mastermind. You know, we go over news, headlines, technicals, fundamentals, earnings, economics, the Fed, you know, whatever it is, whatever is the, you know, whatever's going on in the market, we talk about it. All right. So, you know, if you want to tap in live, you know, follow the Mastermind Group LLC on Instagram. The link is always in the bio. Or you could just save the link. It's the same link every every day. I don't know if everybody realizes that it's the same link. Um, but yeah, let's jump into it. Affirmation of the day. Right. Make sure you gain your daily affirmations, you know, sign up for those daily texts. All right. Um, link is link is below in the, in the recording. So today's affirmation is I am expanding my belief of what's possible. All right. I am expanding my belief of what's possible. All right. Got to get out, cut out those limiting beliefs. You know, uh, you know, your belief is the foundation of your desires coming to fruition. So if you have doubt. If you not, don't have complete and utter belief, you know, it won't manifest. All right, so that's very important. All right, so let's jump into some of these headlines for today. All right. You know, a lot of uh, a lot going on with Russia and Ukraine. We got a lot of, you know, meetings set up and stuff like that. So let me, uh, let's run through these headlines. All right, so investors monitor Russia-Ukraine talks and China's COVID lockdown. I don't know if y'all see the China's market uh, index, well, I should say Hong Kong specifically, I believe, you know, dropped 4% last night in the overnight session, you know, on worries of, you know, different businesses, be, you know, getting shut down due to the latest COVID outbreak over there. All right, All right so let's jump into it. So, Dow Industrials turned low, lower Monday afternoon, giving up more than 400, 400 point gain. And uh, it was it was a nice bull trap today. A very nice bull trap. You know, we had the run up early on, you know, um, probably stopped a couple people out, you know, stop loss hunting. And then um, we started to turn back lower. Right? Um, investors were monitoring Russia and Ukraine updates and China's COVID lockdown while awaiting this week's Federal Reserve decision. What's happening? The Dow fell 2% last week for its fifth straight weekly decline, while the S&P 500 has dropped four of the last five weeks and is down 12% from its record close established just after the new year. Um, so what's driving markets? Right? Ukraine and Russia held a fourth round of talks on Monday after a weekend in which Russia pounded a military training base near the border uh, uh, near the border with Poland, killing at least 35 people. Russia continued its offensive on Monday throughout Ukraine. Talks between Moscow and Kyiv have paused and will resume on Tuesday, an advisor to Ukraine President Zelensky said Monday afternoon, according to the Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, U.S. and Chinese security officials met in Rome on Monday as the U.S. alleged that Russia was seeking military equipment from the world's number two economy. We see the Ukraine war reducing global growth, increasing inflation, and, hold on, let me say that again. <laughs> that's, uh, that's whew. let me say that again. We see the Ukraine war reducing global growth increasing inflation and putting central banks in a bind, wrote BlackRock Investment Institute's Alex Brazier and others in a Monday note. Now, uh, BlackRock's pretty, they're, they're pretty on point. You know, for those that don't know, they come out with a, you know, a weekly commentary every Monday um, on the BlackRock Investment Institute. I love to read through those, uh, those reports. They have a lot of great commentary. But this is interesting because you guys got to remember BlackRock is the biggest asset manager um, in the world, right? So, you know, them saying that they see global growth, re you know, reducing and increased inflation, you know, um, you know, you got to pay attention. Definitely got to pay attention. You know, they're a heavy hitter, right? 
Um, so they said that they said they favored developed market equities while remaining underweight government bonds. Right. I mean, so, I mean, for those that, that don't understand the relationship of bonds and stocks, it's like, um, usually when the bond market is trash, investors are pouring money into equities. And we've seen real bond yields negative over the last couple of years as the stock market has soared. Because like I was saying, where's the money gonna go, right? The money can only go so many places. And with the bond market not looking attractive at all, and you know, silver and gold weren't moving that much. Um, we have seen a pop in gold recently, but you know, um, a lot of money was piling into the equities market, right? Over the weekend, the head of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, um, Georgieva, I believe, said in an interview with CBS News is face the nation that she expects a deep recession in Russia due to unprecedented sanctions by the West and that a Russian sovereign default remains a possibility. Separately, China locked down the key southeastern manufacturing hub of Shenzhen as it also combats a COVID outbreak in the northeast of the country. The Chinese lockdowns have the potential to further exacerbate supply chain woes with inflation already running at nearly 8%. Right. Um, the backdrop of uncertainties has forced strategists to lower their outlook for equities. Those at Goldman Sachs lowered their year end price target for the S&P 500 to 4,700 from 4,900, citing the surge in commodities prices and the weaker outlook for US and global growth. On Friday, Goldman's economists cut their GDP forecast and said the odds of a US recession next year were as high as 35%. Wow. Still ahead for this week is the US Central Bank's policy gathering set to kick off on Tuesday. The Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates for the first time since 2015 to 2018 on Wednesday in response to surging inflation. Wow. Ah, it's not looking good, y'all. You know, we got growth slowing, we got inflation rising. You know, this is not a great economic environment right now. There's a lot of uncertainty and with growth slowing, um, it does bring some worry. All right, so let's um, let's read through some of these top global uh, global headlines, and then we could read through the company headlines. All right, so oil falls, Dow rises as investors track Ukraine war. The Dow climbed, oil prices fell, and Treasury yields hit their highest level in almost three years as investors surveyed developments in Ukraine and awaited a likely interest rate rise. Ukraine and Russia resumed talks as Moscow's bombing campaign grinds on. The diplomatic efforts came after an attack on a Kyiv uh, residential building that left two people dead and 12 wounded. Uh, treasury yields rebound to multi-year highs. The yield on the 10-year treasury note hit the highest intraday level since July, 2019 as investors worry the isolation of Russia will add to inflation by boosting commodity prices. Right. The inflation hits just keep coming, raising stakes for the Fed. Rising oil prices, the Ukraine war and continuing supply chain issues have complicated the Federal Reserve's push to tame inflation. The challenges boost the risk that rates go up to levels that ultimately tip the economy into recession. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. All right. uh, nickel price surge puts Chinese manufacturers in a bind. Suppliers of nickel compounds have sent notices to their customers and investors warning of price hikes and slowdowns in their ability to accept or meet orders, right? Um, so, you know, a shock to the nickel market, you know, as we saw last week, you know, we saw prices in nickel soar, you know, to, um, to extreme highs, right, based on, you know, the futures trading that was going on. Uh, but, you know, demand for nickel is only going to continually increase at a strong pace due to EVs. 
Chinese stocks slide as COVID-19 lockdowns add to investor concerns. Hong Kong's Hang Seng closed at a six-year low as China's escalating COVID-19 battle rattled a market contending with potential U.S. delistings, regulatory pressure, and the economic overspill of the Ukraine war. Will financial stability get nickel and dimed? The leap in nickel prices leaves many wondering what lies ahead. And Credit Suisse strat uh, strategist Zoltan Pazar highlights parallels to previous crises. Investors dash to haven assets during market turmoil. Gold and government bonds are popular investments as the Ukraine crisis boots commodities prices and spreads uncertainty. You know, so a lot of the headlines has to do, um, you know, with the with the ten year rising. Um, and just the uncertainty, the increasing uncertainty in the market, right? Um, and global growth slowing down. We all know that, you know, GDP affects the stock market because, you know, uh, corporate profits or cor corporation growth is a part of GDP. So if GDP is pulling back, that means we're probably gonna see earnings pull back, right? All right, so top company news, um, HBO Max streaming service Discovery Plus to combine post-merger. Discovery CFO didn't say how much a combined app might cost, but said the company will likely offer both ad-free and ad-light options. Next, Elon Musk says Tesla, SpaceX facing significant inflationary pressure. The world's richest, richest person said he has no plans to sell his cryptocurrency holdings and offered financial advice to his followers. Um, Ford revs up EV plans in Europe. The automake, automaker plans to invest $2 billion in the production of two new fully electric vehicles in Germany and build an electric car battery plant in Turkey as part of its drive to produce solely electric vehicles in Europe. Um, Merck's COVID-19 pill heavily used so far despite concerns. Doctors have turned to the drug called Malnupiravir, partly because a rival Pfizer pill has been in limited supply. All right, um, so that's some of our, our top company news for the day, All right? Now let's take a look at what we can expect from the Fed meeting this upcoming week. CNNBC had a nice article put out. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Right, because this this uh, more than likely will move the markets as we come up on Wednesday. All right, so Federal Reserve meets this week and is expected to begin unwinding the massive economic help it provided during the pandemic. That process will likely start with a quarter percentage point interest rate hike, but also will entail several other actions. And I think that's what's important because the market, you know, you know, we could take a look at the Fed fund futures really quickly. Uh, let's take a look at the Fed fund futures really quick. So as you can see, we're, you know, 98% probability right now that we get a, a quarter point um, hike, right? Um, Right. But what else they're going to do or the commentary, I think, is what's going to move the markets. You know, if they kind of comment on how aggressive they're going to be or how not aggressive they're going to be, um, if they're going to wait it out, you know, if they're looking at, uh, you know, a hike at every meeting, you know, I think right now the market is pricing in a hike at every meeting. Yeah, so right now it's a 35% chance we get a hike at every meeting so far, All right? So it'll be interesting to see as we get closer to Wednesday. Um, policymakers will update their future outlook for rates as well as GDP, inflation, and unemployment. At the last update, officials indicated inflation running at just a 2.7%, obviously a massive undershoot from what is prevailing this year, All right. All right, so, Let's get into 
Um, so there's three main topics here, interest rates, the economic and inflation outlook, and the balance sheet. So let's briefly touch on, you know, all of these. All right, the economic outlook supports the Fed's current plans to boost the federal funds rate in March and to begin to reduce their balance sheet over the summer, wrote David Kelly, chief global strategist for JP Morgan Funds. However, there are a number of areas of uncertainty which should make them a little more cautious and tightening. Right? So interest rates. Um, the 25 is a given. Talk about the 25 basis point height. What matters most is what comes after, says Simona uh, Mokuda, chief economist at State Street Global Advisors. A lot can happen between now and the end of the year. The uncertainty is super high. The trade-offs have worsened considerably. From a market perspective, hold on, let me, let me back up a little bit. Current pricing indicates the equivalent of seven, like we just saw in the, um, on the Fed Funds futures, seven total increases this year or one at each meeting. A pace Mooket thinks is too aggressive. However, traders are, even, are split evenly over whether the FOMC will hike by 25 or 50 basis points in May, should inflation currently at its highest levels since the early 1980s continue to push higher. So let's look at the May. So if we look at May, we are seeing a higher 55% chance that we get a 50 basis point hike in May. Right? So that's, you know, that's an increase in how aggressive, you know, the Fed is going to be, right? All right. Um, Uh, right, so like I said, traders are split between the 25 basis point in May, should inflation continue to push higher. From a market perspective, the key assessment would be whether the hike is dovish, indicative of a cautious path ahead or a hawkish in which officials signal that they are determined to keep raising rates to fight inflation, even if there are some adverse effects on growth. It's interesting. We think the message around the rate hike has to be at least somewhat hawkish. The real question is whether the Fed is carefully hawkish or aggressively hawkish, and whether the meeting springs any surprises or not, wrote Krishna Guha, head of central bank strategy at Evercore. Our call is that the Fed will be carefully hawkish and will avoid springing any surprises that might add to uncertainty and volatility. I think, you know, that's my expectation too, you know, for them to be hawkish but not, you know, scare the markets too much, right? Regardless of exactly how it goes, the dot plot will see substantial revisions from the last update three months ago, in which members penciled in just three, uh, just three hikes this year and about six more over the next two years. The longer run or terminal rate also could get boosted up from the 2.5% indication. All right, so now economic and inflation outlook. Wall Street economists expect the new inflation outlook to bump up the full year estimate to about 4%, though gains in subsequent years are expected to move little from December's respective um, projections of 2.3 and 2.1%. Still, the sharp upward revision to the 2022 figure should keep Fed officials focused on the need to respond to too high inflation with tighter policy settings especially against a backdrop of strong, if now more uncertain growth and an historically tight labor market. Economists figure there also will be adjustments to this year's outlook for GDP, which could be slowed by the war in Ukraine, explosive inflation and tightening in financial conditions. Oof, not looking good. December's uh, SEP pointed to GDP growth of 4% this year. Goldman Sachs recently lowered its full year outlook to just 2.9%. The Atlanta Fed GDP now gauge is tracking first quarter growth of just 0.5%. Sheesh. Damn, Goldman lowered to 2.9%. Wow. The war has pushed the Fed staff geo, geopolitical risk index the highest level since the Iraq war. Goldman economists. Goldman is very bearish. Right? Goldman is very bearish. Then they put out a, 
they put out a, a a report a few weeks ago saying that we might go to 30, what was it 3,600, 3,700? So they, they've been pretty bearish for a few weeks now, a couple months actually. Right. Um, I guess they said it has already raised food and energy prices and it threatens to create new supply chain disruptions as well, right? And with this China, you know, lockdown, you know, that could definitely affect, you know, a lot of things are produced and made in China. So that could definitely affect supply chains as well. Right. And even, you know, uh, increase inflation even more. All right. So the so the balance sheet. Right. Balance sheet reduction will likely be discussed, but increased uncertainty makes us think formal normalization principles will be announced in May or June. Most Wall Street estimates figure the Fed will allow about one hundred billion dollars in bond proceeds to roll off each month rather than being reinvested in new bonds as is currently the case. That process is expected to start in the summer and Fed Chairman Jerome Powell likely will be asked to address it during his post-meeting news conference. Powell's Q&A with the press sometimes moves markets more than the actual post-meeting statement, that's a fact, right? Mokuda, the State Street economist said that given Fed policy acts with a lag Generally considered to be six months to a year, Powell should focus more on the future rather than the present. The question remains, where are you going to be in the middle of 2023, she said. How is inflation, how is growth going to look then? This is the reason I think the Fed should be more dovish and should communicate that. Right. So the market is going to be paying very close attention to what happens on Wednesday. Right. And not, you know, not more so the statement itself, but how Powell responds to the questions that are asked, right? Because, you know, people tend to really ask some, you know, some, some real interesting questions to get inside the mind of the Fed and see, you know, they usually, you know, a lot more is revealed in the question after the statement than the actual statement, right? Uh, but you'll probably see markets immediately. Don't get caught in a trap, though. Right, because you you might see markets react to the statement, and then you could you know see a reversal not too long after that, depending on what's said during the press conference. Right. All right, so you know, let's take a look at the economic calendar real quick. All right, so got PPI tomorrow. Um, producer price index. So that, you know, that's going to tell us how inflation is, you know, affecting, you know, manufacturers and producers and things like that. All right. Got retail sales on Wednesday, along with the FOMC, um, Fed funds rate announcement, and of course, Jerome Powell's um, conference, of course, initial jobless claims Thursday. All right. And then, um, index of leading economic indicators Friday in existing home sales, right? But all roads lead to Wednesday, right? And then we had news of a couple more meetings going on. I think Biden is flying to Europe um, for a meeting. I think NATO's having an emergency meeting this week. I think, you know, Putin has a meeting with, um, I think Putin has a meeting with Iran or something. It's just a lot going on this week, y'all. So, you know, just be careful with your trades, um, you know, practice risk management. Um, and y'all know all the, all the good stuff. All right, so let's, anybody got anything else to add as, as far as the, you know, economics, the war, um, what to expect this week before we move to the charts? Now we can come back and uh, you know talk about the economics. Let's, let's let's take it to the charts though for a second. All right. So looking at ES here, I'm gonna zoom out. Ooh, we got the death cross today. We got the death cross, y'all. So the 50 cross below the 200 today. Uh, um, so for those that don't know, that's, um, that really just points to us being in a downturn or confirming the downturn, right? 
Um, but for those that have been watching Market Review, you know we've been in a downtrend since January, right? All right, so let's, uh, um, so if we look at this, let's go back to the daily. I mean, let's start off on the weekly though. So on the weekly, we're still, you know, testing this demand. You can see here, this weekly demand, which starts at 41.69. Look where we closed that today. Um, well, you can see we're, we're, we're at 41.70 in the after hours. Um, but you can see buyers are stepping in at this weekly demand, pushing, you know, pushing sellers back outside of this daily demand or this weekly demand here. All right. Now we are in a daily demand, right? Uh, you can see created on, uh, what's this? Um, this was Friday, Thursday, created on Tuesday and Monday or Wednesday and Tuesday, right? Um, so we kind of got like this a daily demand stacked on top of the weekly here um, around 41.86. Sellers were cutting through that demand though. Uh, sellers were, were cutting through this daily demand and, um, you know, we're making headway and then, you know, uh, buyers stepped in you can kind of see we got like an inverse head and shoulders here on the 15 minute to close out the day. You know, buyer stepped in, but we're still we're still in a strong downtrend right now. All right. So if we zoom back out, you can see, you know, um, the falling wedge worked out. I mean, the rising wedge worked out that we had pointed out. We came back up. We kind of made like this double top here. We had the first top here, came down, bounced off the 23.6 fib here and then we we came back up and then um you know sellers protected this 38.2 fib here all right you can see support 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 right and then you can see that support turning into resistance here that 38.2 fib all right and you can see we continue to trade lower you can see we had a drop base drop uh today right so nice double top here off the off the 38.2 fit, you know, uh, got the confirmation on the four hour bearish engulfing, continue to trade lower. And then you can see today, again, you know, we had a nice move down and um, buyers are just pushing back out of this demand now, right now, right? Um, keep your eyes on the four hour uh, and the daily. I mean, the daily is still increasingly bearish. As you can see, you know, the nine is even separating itself from the 20 even more, which means the downtrend is, you know, you know, gaining strength. Uh, but, you know, this four hour here, look like, you know, there's some strong buyers here um, under 41.69. We could see a short term bounce. I think we could see a, a maybe a bounce tomorrow back up to test the nine and the 20 and then you know, uh, I think we can see a dead cat bounce tomorrow. And then, you know, for the rest of the rest of the week, um, as we go through the Fed meeting, we probably trade lower. I think I, I really want to see us test January lows, though, or February lows. I want to see us come back down to that 4,100 level. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, it kind of looks like we could be forming a pattern here, but that'll be the confirmation if we continue to go lower here, right? So you can kind of see we're making higher highs, I mean, higher lows right here. Um, so we could be forming like this type of triangular pattern, but we'll see if this, you know, this trend line, this bottom trend line can hold going into tomorrow, right? And I say watch the four hour because if we see a cross, you know, another bullish cross in a four hour after the Fed meeting, you know, that might give the market some, uh, some strength. And that might mean we, we're in for a short term, a short term pop. Right. So just keep your eyes out on that. Um, so, you know, to simplify, we're trading inside of this weekly demand right now, going back to May of 2021. Um, we did just have the death cross, right? We did just have the death cross, so that's very bearish. Right? So typically, you know, it varies on different stocks, but sometimes after a death cross, you can see the stock like plummet, 
But sometimes after the death cross, you know, because the stock has already been trading down, the stock will start to reverse, right? Um, so yeah, just, just keep, you know, we got the nine and the 20 bearish, we got the death cross bearish. Um, yeah, and then, um, you know, all time frames are pretty much bearish right now. One hour, four hour, daily, weekly, monthly, every, everything is pretty bearish right now. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't bounce out of this demand, but you know, there's just so much uncertainty right now in the market that uh, I think the only thing that's gonna, you know, we need a ceasefire. We need, uh, you know, China coming out saying they're not, you know, gonna support Russia or they're not, you know, they're not entertaining it. We need some kind of news, uh, you know, to get the Mac, the, the market back up in that upswing. Right? As y'all can be, as y'all have seen, this is a pretty news driven market as we've seen over the last few weeks. Um, so the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ, let me go to the weekly. Ooh, the NASDAQ looks like it might break that monthly demand. It might break that monthly demand, you know, if it continues to sell off here, right? Uh, so if we look, NASDAQ currently is down 22% from the high. So that's, you know, obviously bear market territory. Um, but you can see we're, we're actually testing, if you do a FIB um, from September, either September's, September of 2020's lows or October of 2020's lows, you can see we're, we're kind of testing that 61A FIB level here right so it'll be interesting to see you know if uh buyers hold that level that thirteen thousand level right uh trey said why do you want to see a 4101 retest uh because i think it will be healthy i think it will be healthy for the market um to complete that um you know i think when we originally tested 41 um, the market never truly settled down there, right? It was a bunch of limit orders here that the market reacted to and bounced off. But, and that's why, you know, I wasn't really convinced that we were gonna reverse because usually before a, a true reversal, you'll see the market accumulate for a period of time, right? And I never thought we really had that accumulation. So I want us to come back to 4101 to see some healthy accumulation. And then, you know, that could set us up for a nice rally, you know, uh, going into summer, right? Um, and also because I have puts. <laughs> uh, but yeah. All right, so let's look at... Um, <laughs> yeah, a little selfish, a little selfish. Um, so yeah, that's the NASDAQ. Um, oh, Aki saying don't buy anything until the Fed funds rate gets back to 2.5? Yes, peace in abundance. That is correct. And so that's not till 2023. Hey, you know what it is. Yo, why is Goldman out here like... <laughs> Yo, Goldman is out here scaring people. Because Goldman watching market review, that's why. <laughs> they said 4,700 on the year. So that's a, that's a negative year. They late. Right? They late. Tell them they late. That's a flat year. If we, if we, if we end up at 47, that's a, a negative 1.5% year, um, which I think, I don't mind that because I think that sets us up for an amazing 2023 and 2024. You know, I think this, that sets us up for an amazing 2023. This this rebound that we about to get once this flush is done, everybody on this call right now better be walking away. I don't want no excuses. <laughs> nah, for real though. Because people forgot about the new roaring 20s. He's still in it. He's still in it. Nah, you're right though. I I think 
I think what we're going to see after this over the next couple of years is going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing after, you know, after they shake all the weekends out, you know, um, after the stop loss hunting is done, you know, I think, um, I think we'll see an amazing rally, you know, up to 5k, up to 5,000 and beyond. Right. Them, oh man, those December spy, those December 2024 spies, man, you know, those, those, those are going to print, you know, those are going to, those are going to be really nice. But I think we get past all of these headwinds and tailwinds, you know, definitely by next year. And, um, uh, what strike, I mean, it depends on you, you know, it depends on you. Um, You know, can never go wrong close to the money. You know, I would say a, a 500 strike on a spy. So even if we do have this negative year that Goldman is talking about, even if we do have a 4,700 year, your, your contract is still going to be doing really well. Yeah, I would say, you know, 500 strike on a spy. I was even looking at the 500 strike on the January 2024. You know, um, so, yeah, I don't think you could go wrong. You know, what I like to do also, I like to do, I like to look at what the, you know, the annual growth is, right? Quick detour. Um, so what I like to do is I like to see what the average growth is after the last financial crisis. So if I throw in the SPY here, right? Uh, I'm on portfolio visualizer, by the way. So I can see that. Since 2009, the SPY has been averaging about 15%, right? So if I come in here and I do like, all right, so let's say conservatively, um, the SPY averages like 10%, right? That puts us at 5,200 next year. And then let's say it does conservatively on average another 10%, right? That puts us at about 5,800, right? So if you're looking at December 2024 calls, you know, you could play with, you know, play with that, like 5,000, 5,500. You probably want to stay within that range of, you know, a very base case of, you know, an average of 10% this, you know, over the next two years. So let's say even this year, we do do a negative 2%. And then next year, you know, we rally and we do, you know, uh, twenty two percent or something like that. that's still like a ten percent average, right? But it all depends on what your risk is. It all depends on what your risk is and you know how much time you have, right? But yeah, definitely check out those December twenty twenty fours, even the January twenty twenty fours as well. Right? I only said the December twenty twenty fours because I think that's the farthest out you can go right now uh, for the spy. Right? All right, so let's look at the VIX. So again, the VIX still holding above 29 and 30. Still holding. Um, it's still holding. I don't know if we about to get a cup and handle here. And then we bounce, but I, I'm expecting the VIX to hit 40. It, I just feel like it has to at this point, but I could be wrong. Um, We've been testing 37, 38, you know. Um, I think the last time we had VIX 40 was close to the election, right? Um, was election, yeah, it was election time, right? Um, but yeah, I think I think we, we, we could see VIX hit 40 this week and we could see the S&P hit 4,100, right? But like I said, it could provide a buying opportunity you know, especially for, for your leaks, you got to think the stock market is, the NASDAQ is down 22%. Like, put this in perspective, right? Microsoft's earnings came out and the stock spiked to 350. Does that mean Microsoft isn't like, like the value isn't there now because of what's going on in the market? No. Cloud gaming is still ramping. Azure is still ramping. You know, like uh, a lot of these business, uh, some of these business businesses haven't really changed at all. 
and are down, you know, you know, these huge percentages. So just put that in perspective. Like, what do you think is going to happen when all this uncertainty leaves the market? Right. Like, Microsoft isn't staying at 275. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not staying there. And if you look at if you look at Will Wisdom, um, a lot of uh, let's take let's let's look at BlackRock for example, the biggest asset manager in the world. Right. If you look at what they were doing in the fourth quarter, they bought almost 12 million shares of Microsoft. Right. The heavy hitters have been buying you know, companies like Microsoft up, right? So what do you think is going to happen when all this uncertainty, you know, leaves, right? You know, Microsoft is going to spike, right? And, you know, over the last few weeks, you have seen that Wall Street loves Microsoft way more than it does Apple. That's how they've been trading. On green days, Microsoft is up way more than Apple over these last few weeks, right? Um, <laughs> Greg, you're funny, man. Um, but yeah, just like, you know, even like an a, a NVIDIA, right? Which was at 350, now trading at 213, right? You know, a lot of these companies are on sale. These, these businesses aren't, you know, like, think about it. Has NVIDIA or Microsoft's earnings been affected by has NVIDIA's earnings been affected by 39%, 40%? Like, really, come on, All right? This is a buying opportunity for some of these names, and especially shares, you know? You know, especially if you're, if you're into getting stock, you know, you know, catching NVIDIA 40% off, whew. You know, this is a company that is in everything when it comes to do with the future. Like, NVIDIA, like, I remember I did fundamentals in NVIDIA before and it took me eight hours just because so much stuff on their website, like they're doing so much in different, you know, in different areas, EVs, you know, Omniverse, you know, um, uh, semiconductors, chips, uh, GPUs, data centers, parallel computing, supercomputing, like the list goes on and on and on and on. So like, and that's why it's important to understand the fundamentals of the businesses so you can understand whether the business is on sale or not. Right. Um, but yeah, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities here in the market. A lot, a lot of opportunities. Uh, and, you know, if you want to take advantage of these opportunities, you just, the main thing when it comes to, it's different. See, like investing and trading is different, right? Investing is, is more long-term. So there's not as much risk involved because you don't have limited time, right? But when you're trading options, you have limited time. So it's a little different. So when it comes to like just these companies and these stocks, you know, you can imagine, remember when AMD was at $74, right? Remember we saw all this accumulation going on down here? Right. You see, you see the EMA squeezing. It was a lot of accumulation going on. And then what happened? In less than three months, you know, or you know, for that rest of the year, stock went from 74 to 164. Right. We're we're at those times again with some of these companies trading at these, you know, these really, really low levels. And I'm talking about the business, the ones that have strong businesses. Right, the ones that have strong businesses. Um, Apple right now is in this weekly demand um, at 150. You know, um, so we'll see if this can hold. This is a really important level here for Apple. You can see it was resistance, right? Now it's turning into support and demand. Um, if Apple, you know, breaks below this, you could you could probably expect it to drag the the market you down even further. Oh, uh, what's good, Aki? My bad. I didn't even see your hand. Nah, keep going. To keep going. I'm going to let you finish. No, nah, I'm just going through, you know, some of the solid businesses, you know, um, Apple, Microsoft, uh, AMD, NVIDIA. You know, you can see that, you know, 
a lot of these businesses are on sale. You know, you got to ask yourself: Is is Microsoft really going to be at two seventy five a year from now? Like, be real with yourself. Come on. Do you want me to answer that or no? No, it was it was kind of rhetorical, but you can. <laughs> That'll be a no. They're gonna be down by one fifty, one sixty. Oh. <laughs> but not Microsoft, bro. Not Microsoft. Okay, so let's let's talk about it. We got Shenzhen closed down, shut it down. Ooh. I mean, Fox talk about up. it. I mean, Foxconn not producing no chips and no devices for Apple, the fruit company. So that little 150 demands on that about to slide right through that. Like a child at the, at the park, sliding down the slide, enjoying themselves. Bye. So <clears throat> let's talk about what happened today. I'm sorry. If we look at the top 10% gainers, go to the public watch list. If you got to think and swim. It wasn't no heavy hitters in there. You know what was in there on top 10% on NYSE? VXX. And that's what yeah. you play if you want to play the VIX. Right? Nobody, Signet Jury, jury. I don't know why that was in there, but uh, some people, you know, think things about to get a little shaky, so you know, they're gonna put some money in the jury stocks, right? Everything else, under $10. I mean, Nielsen was, but we ain't going to really talk about that. So, you know what else was down today? XLE. Oil. Yeah. Steel. Oil. Oil got smacked. You know what that's telling me? Ain't nowhere safe. Mm. And when there's nowhere safe. But the tenure was up. I tell you something. And when there's nowhere safe, cash is a position or get you some puts. You better not be buying no calls right now. <laughs> They're not safe. They're not safe. Because, see, the, the person that thought, you know, Facebook was at a discount at 200, you know, they stomach hurting mm. right now. The person that thought Square was a discount at 150. Shit. And the person that think Microsoft is at a discount right now, hey Apple, that's a no. Don't put don't don't even think about putting a call, nothing. <laughs> hey, Just Microsoft deep. is at a discount though. It ain't it ain't deep enough. Hey, hey, hey. It can go lower, but it is at a discount. It's not deep enough. <laughs> but all that's going on, right? We got this new variant. We got the China, China shutting down a tech hub. I mean, like, because of a new variant, locking down 51 million people. Because of a variant that's already been existing in the US. So if they shut down for an extended period of time, Brazil stops production of tech that the US needs. I mean, the precursor of this new variant for a prolonged period of time. What happens next quarter for the fruit company? Mm. It's going to be like a bad apple pie. Like, it's going to be like a bad apple pie, you know, from Thanksgiving. Imagine, imagine Apple's earnings coming out and saying that iPhone sales decreased. Imagine that. Imagine how, what that does to the stock price. So, did we all forget Jerome and Brother Biden said it's going to be rough? I, I can be scaring the people. Happy birthday. Look at the, look at the, look at the comments, man. Look at the comments. I'm scaring the people. Yeah. Tone it down a little bit. Listen. <laughs> What I'm saying is a perspective. That is it. I can be wrong. Did I need to start with that? I can be wrong. Do not listen to me. Do your homework. I'm just one perspective. 
All right, so boom. Now, yeah. back to the task at hand. So the death cost just happened on the ES. What does that mean? Is it, is it really time to be buying anything? That's a great point. Is it really time to be buying anything? Like, what, what's certain right now? You know, what's certain? The sun should come up tomorrow. <laughs> That's, That's the only all we got right money. now, right? That's all we got. <laughs> the sun should come up tomorrow, right? Now, Brother Jerome said, you know, inflation is transitory. It's not. We realizing that. Professor Jay was reading a report about the author saying that a year ago they paid Sixty dollars to fill their tank. Just a week ago, they paid ninety dollars. That's a fifty percent increase. Did anybody in the chat get a fifty percent increase in their pay year over year? Please drop a one. Absolutely not. So, and, and for the people that's like, nah, they're not raising rates. Okay, that's okay. I've been saying it. Let's get this inflation going. <laughs> the $10 menu. Let's keep it going. Please keep it going. Because when this ain't going to be no bubble. This going to be like an iceberg flipping upside down in the ocean. Look it up on YouTube. It's kind of pretty sight. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So, like, and then there's all these jobs available, you know, unemployment rate coming down low. Okay, what happens when um, the laws on the books start incorporating automation? And then the layoffs start. And the Fed is like, well, we still got to raise rates because we got to bring down this inflation, you know, and it was jobs available a year ago, so you know we just stick it to the two of the things because again, this was not a financial crisis. This was a health crisis. That, lo and behold, is no longer a crisis. We back to normal. We can travel and go anywhere, no mask. Mm. And people still buying homes. 40,000 over asking, 100,000 over asking, 200,000 over asking in the up market. You know what that is? That's buying arc at the top. I'm done. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, uh, don't want to be doing that. We know how that turned out. We know how that turned out. Yeah, y'all. It's, uh, it's so much. You know, you know, uh, Aki kind of laid it out, you know, perfectly. It's so much going on right now. And, um, you know, the stock market doesn't like uncertainty. It just doesn't. Um, we're seeing, you know, record oil prices, record commodity prices. We're seeing inflation at record levels. We're seeing growth expect, which is, this is the, the biggest thing, right? Growth expectations are pulling back. That's not good at all. You know, <clears throat> if GDP growth, ex we're seeing analysts saying that we're at risk of a recession, right? So the, the sentiment right now is not great at all, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities. Like there's still opportunities here, right? Uh, but, you know, you want to wait for confirmation. I haven't seen any confirmation of a reversal yet, right? We've been seeing bull traps for the last two months, right? Every other day looks like a reversal, right? But you know, if you know, if you if you have the funds, feel free to to scale in, but you just have to be you have to be comfortable if the market slides another five percent, right? You know, if some of these stocks slide another five to ten percent, 
right? You, you have to understand the risk when getting involved, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's the main problem I see with people is they end up blowing their account um, is because they don't understand the risk, right? And then they trade off emotions because they're not comfortable with the risk in the trade, right? Um, so, you know, everybody's account is different. Everybody's account size is different. Everybody's personality, experience, emotions are different, right? So there's not a one size fits all, right? Um, I just tell y'all from me and, you know, I can very well be wrong in my approach, but I am, I don't see anything signifying a reversal yet so therefore um i'm not going long you know, i still feel like the market is uncertain i still feel like there's still potential downside and that's just my personal thesis like i can be wrong that's why it's like i always say it's important to have your own thesis right you shouldn't be depending on a tom lee or a goldman or a jp or a blackrock right it's good to get insight from them and understand how they're thinking, but you should be coming up with your own thesis. You shouldn't be looking at anybody else for your own thesis, right? And, um, you know, you got to put in the work, y'all. Don't, like, if you really want to, like, be free off this and do this long term and teach this to your kids and, you know, create that general generational wealth from this, like, you have to learn this and understand it. You can't like depend on somebody else to, you know, keep providing you with a thesis or what to do or how to, you know, um, hedge and rotate your portfolio. And, you know, we all have to start somewhere and learn from somebody, but there's a difference in learning from somebody versus depending on somebody, right? And there's a lot of people out here depending on people. And then when shit hits the fan, they blame, they blame other people. You can't do that. You gotta put the work in yourself and understand this stuff, right? You know, the people that you hear, like, like when you hear Aki talk, or when you hear Quill talk, or when you hear Jay, or when you hear anybody, or Axel, Key, and it don't matter, everybody that you know is associated with this platform it's like these are people that put in the work behind the scenes these are people that are constantly learning right these you know you know you can hear it because they put the work in right or anybody that you hear speak on this stuff is they put the work in like they don't depend on other people you know they they do their own their own research they up late reading and you know, I'd be up at 3 a.m. looking at charts sometimes, you know? So it's like, don't depend on other people. You've got to put your own work in, right? And like, like I'm, I'm not criticizing nobody. It's okay to learn from other people. It's okay. But don't get to a point where you're depending on them, right? Yeah, go ahead, Aki. Thank you that, very much for that, MJ. Um, Listen, you don't depend on nobody to breathe. I'm going to repeat that again. You don't depend on anyone to breathe. This, this investing and trading needs to be like breathing. That's, that's the level you need to get to. And whatever it takes, right, you got to stay up a little late or give your... I'm, I'm, I know everybody got at least seven hours a week. At least. Because I know all y'all got Netflix. Or a special show you love to watch. You know, that might have to go and pause. If you really want to do this. Right? Because again, if you're investing, best believe the money you think you can gain, it can be taken. You don't want to step in this arena on, on shaky legs. You want to step in it cool, calm, and collective. 
So yes, you come to market review, you know, Monday through Thursday. But uh, do, not other, enough. Do, do other work. This ain't it. This not it. I mean, we love y'all coming here and, and giving us your time, but like soon we're gonna start asking folks in the in the audience, if you drop a ticket, boom, pull up a, a share, start, you know, uh setting it up for, for everybody. Let's let's see what you do on the chart. This ain't calling up on nobody. This is more or less like pushing us forward. Because I remember when looking at the charts was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this I'm, I'm staring at the screen for an hour and I'm still trying to figure out what is going on. And I'm on year six and I still ain't at profit because my tuition bill was kind of high. But I'm still rocking out because I see the vision. Like, let me, let me, I just said it, right? Gas up 50% year over year. You ain't get a raise like that. Tell me a job you could do that and you get a 50% year over year raise. But with this, you could do that. And you don't gotta be all over the place. Just start small, slow build, right? Connected to real world issues. If you're driving a Honda, all right, where all the parts come from with this Honda? If you like going to BP or Shell, okay, where, where they getting that oil from? For, I, I implore you to do this. Track every dollar you spend and connect it to a publicly traded company. I mean, every dollar to the penny. Because you're going to be invested in that because guess what? That's your dollars that you're working hard for that you're kicking out. I mean, would you rather them be paying you to pay them? I mean, that's a gem right there. Because mm -hmm. see, if, if you was in the commodities and understanding what was going on, you know, you could have been an XLE call since January of last year, or even this year, you know, and one contract could have paid your gas bill for the whole year. Isn't that funny? Energies just subsidize your entire energy bill for the whole year. Mm -hmm. So who pay who? I'm done. Mm. It's a, you know, bars. Bars, y'all. That's a gem. That's a gem. You know, <clears throat> you got to put in the work, man. Everything has a price. You know, um, you know, I remember uh, Mark Monroe saying that he uh, first started, he put in 30 hours a week, um, you know, to the market. It's like a full-time job or well, part-time technically, but, you know, it's, it's, it's about the time that you put in. Right, it's about the time that you put in your uh your effort and your energy will always be returned. So whatever you put in is what you get out. If you want to take shortcuts, your returns are going to be shortcutted. Right, you know whatever you put out is what you get. You know, so like Aki said, you know, you got to get to a point where it's just like breathing, right? and um. You got to continue to put put in that time, put in that effort, you know, put in the research, put in, you know, like, um, like Axel said, too, it's like sacrificing certain things, right? It's, you know, it's that time allocation that I spoke about a few weeks back, you know, where's your time going? Where's your energy going? Where's your focus going? And what are you getting back from it, right? It's about producing and not consuming. Right, Netflix, TV, social media is all consumption. Right, it's all consumption. Like, I think the difference between people that are successful and people that aren't is that the successful people produce. Right? They spend more time producing than consuming. 
right? So a lot of, we're in a we're in an era where it's all about consumption, right? We get we get fed with food commercials, you know, TV shows, and you know, it's all about consumption. Uh, we're, we on feeds, right? You're, you're an endless feed of social media posts, just an endless feed. It's it's just all consumption. All right, so we got to shift our mindset from a consumer mindset to a production mindset, right? And the way that you produce is doing things that are going to elevate you, that are going to, um, you know, we talk about dividends in the stock market, but there's things that pay dividends in life, right? Like reading, exercising, meditating, like there's so much you can do that pays dividends in your life. Right, you can't just look at dividends as like something that you get paid for a stock. Like there's things that have long-term benefits that you can do. All right, and I'm not even just talking about the stock market because at the end of the day, it's all about alignment. All right, so if you're in alignment, you know you're gonna be your your family life is gonna be straight, your relationship is gonna be straight, your investments is gonna be straight, your physical fitness is gonna be straight. It's all about being in alignment. All right. Um, so yeah, you know, we could keep going. Aki, you got, you got anything else to add before we wrap it up? Yeah, I got one more thing. Write a letter to your future self. In the letter, tell him, tell him or her what you did to progress, to get to the point in the future where you want to be. And in that letter should be the blueprint that you need to do to get to that point. And all you got to do is just follow it, right? Because if you look at life in solutions instead of problems, you know, you'll always find a solution because you're not wasting energy and thought on, oh, I, I hate this job or I don't like where I live or I, I want a better car. Everybody got wants, but the difference between wanting something and doing whatever is necessary to get to that point to get it. Hmm. Want more for, for your future you and your future generations than now. And then you won't mind sacrificing what it needs to take to get to the level that you want to get to. <clears throat> Peace and abundance. Peace and abundance, y'all. Pay the price. Peace and abundance, everybody. We'll be back. Thank you for that word, Aki. Be back tomorrow, same time, 4 p.m. Wednesday. If you're not a part of the mastermind group, I promise you, you're missing out. You're doing yourself a huge disservice. We got a portfolio manager coming Wednesday to break down the Fed meeting and also um, discounted cash flow valuation. So tap in. I promise you, you won't regret it. And I'll see y'all tomorrow, 4 p.m., man. Everybody have a great night. Peace and abundance.